There you go. Come on. There we go. Looking at groaning, hoping, and waiting. This year might be a year for us to groan, to hope, and to wait. Just as it is every year. 2022 was a year of groaning, hoping, and waiting. 2023 has been a year of groaning, hoping, and waiting. And I think that also 2024 should be a year of groaning, hoping, and waiting. In verse 22, we see, For we know what the, that the whole world groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. What is Paul talking about here? He's talking about, we look around us and we see the earthquakes and the lightning and the, the tornadoes and the natural disasters. We see the earth even itself awaiting for its adoption, awaiting for its reclamation back to what God had created it to be. It, as though it understands what it was and is awaiting for it to be that once again. In a similar way, we too have an inkling of what Adam and Eve might have experienced. We can think of our bodies in the creation and think of them without decay, without entropy, without these things. We can understand why the earth groans. I think it's also to the point that Jesus, when he came in riding on his donkey, and he scolded the Pharisees and the Sadducees because his disciples were praising him. He says, if these don't, if these men don't, even the stones will cry out. To the point that, that even the earth somehow understands that that time period was special. That the redemption was coming. And I think that that process has continued now for 2,000 years, that the adoption of our bodies, the redemption is closer and closer than it was before. Every day we go closer and closer to either being us absent from the body and to be present with the Lord or the Lord returning. We are groaning in and of ourselves and just eagerly awaiting that. And you know what? That's okay. Has anyone in here ever had a really good cry? A little cathartic, isn't it? Afterwards, you go, okay, it's out. In many ways, we and, and the earth has been awaiting for that release, that letting it all out and, and, and us going back to the situation in which we were before. Your first fill in the blanks if you have your outlines. It's the whole of creation. But it's the childbirth pains of what? As we know, Paul uses this analogy several different times. With childbirth comes just inklings of pain, small contractions that get larger and larger and larger and more painful until finally the child is birthed. John talks about this likewise in the book of Revelation and talking about the, the pains that are to come on the earth during that time. So if we look at the world around us and think if this is just like childbirth, if things get worse and worse for the mom in childbirth, yes, we know that there's an, a happy ending. There's a, there's a reunion of mother and child outside of the, the womb. But it took a lot of pain, a lot of effort, a lot of uh, suffering in the midst of that birth. In many ways, we, along with the earth, have to go through those birth pains. It is as though, by analogy only, that we are waiting to become the sons and daughters of God. We, the earth is groaning to be recreated and to be brought back into a better state. But there's going to be a whole lot of pain before that happens, a lot of contractions. 
There's no simple C-section for this. Instead, it's a long, protracted birth. I think if we can keep that in the back of our minds, that as we go through life, that each bump in the road, each hill to climb, each valley that we go through is a part of this birthing process. That as we grow to look more and more like Christ, those birth pains come. And very often we complain about them, right? Oh, I really need prayer for this. And yes, you need prayer for it, but have you considered that your prayer should be, do I understand it? Do I see what it is creating in me that is making us look more and more like Christ? In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus said it this way, You'll be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened, for those things must take place, but that it is not yet the end. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and in various places there will be famines and earthquakes. But all of these are things are merely the beginning of the birth pains. Man, if that's just the beginning of the birth pains. We look around at the war in Ukraine and the war in Israel. We look at sickness and famine. We look at people hurting across the world and, wow, this is just birth pains? I, I really don't, you know, I don't want to have an escapist mentality, but I really kind of don't want to be here when, when the birth takes place. But yet, if that's the Lord's will, if he tarries and, and I'm still here when that occurs, he will give us the strength to continue. But notice he says, do not be frightened. Do not be afraid of these things, but instead know. As John rightly pointed out when we were going through this passage on Tuesday morning, Jesus doesn't give us all the answers in this passage, Matthew 24, 25. He's answering his disciples three questions about what are the times, what are the seasons, when are you going to return? And he gives them an inkling and we're thankful for that inkling, but it's still not the entire picture. As Jerry and I were talking earlier uh, after service and, and just before service tonight, what we know of the end times is so vastly small compared to the reality. And yet many people think that they know it all down to a T of the exact everything about it. And yet Instead of getting ourselves worked up into a fervor or being frightened about it, let us realize what they are. This is just birth pains. We continue on in Romans 8, verse 23. And not only this, but we also, we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoptions as sons and the redemption of our body. I know many of you understand what it is, that groaning, that waiting for the new bodies to be present with the Lord, to have no more suffering, no more pain, no more tears, no more sickness. But realize that all of those things point to the fact that they are going to be redeemed. There is going to be a thing called the resurrection. There is something called eternity. But until then, we must wait. The hardest words for those two over there to hear is the exact same words I'm telling for us, is to wait. The very fact that God calls us, it's coming, but we do not know the time. We do not know the hour. But instead, he says to wait and to wait Patiently, and as we looked at this morning, wait expectantly. The next fill in the blank this evening is we. Who is it that Paul is talking to here? He's talking to believers. Only believers have that type of hope that we are waiting for the redemption of our bodies. Now, yes, everybody will be resurrected, some to eternal life, and some to eternal condemnation. But both are resurrected. 
It's one of the things that often Christians forget. They just think that it's only the Christians that will be resurrected. But in that day, both the, the, the small and the strong, the meek and the powerful, all will be resurrected to judgment. And yet we have a great hope that we pass from judgment into life and that we will indeed receive our adoption. The big question is, who are you? Are you one who is awaiting your adoption? Are you one who is awaiting to hear the Lord's call? Maybe even your name to come here to be with him? Or are you like the rest of the world where they mock the Lord's return? In fact, Paul comments, says, those who mock and say, where is the, this promise of your Lord's return? Many, especially in the last couple of hundred years, since uh, the church's big focus on, on the end times and on eschatology, I can't tell you how many times I've heard people mockingly say, well, wasn't the Lord supposed to come back in, in this year and in that year and in that year and in that year? The fact is he could come at any time, but for us to make predictions is futile. No one knows the day or the hour. Only the times or the seasons are given. But tonight we're going to do something different. I normally preach right straight through a passage, verse by verse, in chronological order. But we're actually going to back up to verses before the, the message this morning, verses 5 through 8. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds according to the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile towards God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. We have to realize that there's people outside of this room who, while in their bodies right now, are enemies of God, who hate God, who cannot subject themselves unto God's law and are totally unable to do so. These are the type of people, as we were talking even this morning at the table downstairs, uh, people like Ray Comfort reaching and talking to these people who hate God, who shake their fists at God. And until the Holy Spirit grabs a hold of them and takes their hearts of stone and gives them a heart of flesh, that they can understand something other in which, than the world in which they are in whether they're for abortion or whether they're for the LGBTQ movement or before, whether they're for any of the things of the world. It's amazing to see how men gifted like Ray Comfort can present the gospel to them and to see, even in the midst of 20 minutes, how the Holy Spirit can change their hearts of stone and for them to ask important questions like, what must I do. But we have to realize that there are many, maybe even in our families, that are in the flesh and are right now, as of this point, enemies of God. That this year might be the year in which God takes their hearts of stone and gives them hearts of flesh. For us to be able, ready and willing to have that conversation with them. Every year it's my prayer that my parents would be one of those people that God would exchange their hearts of stone for a heart of flesh, even though they know the truth. Unfortunately, they're under more condemnation for knowing what the truth is and still rejecting. We fast forward to chapter, uh, same chapter, verses 9 through 17, and I will summarize this way. Who is it that then are the children of God? John 1, 12 tells us, to those who believe on his name, he has given the right to become the children 
of God. Well, wait, time out, Chris. Aren't we all just the children of God? Oprah told me I'm a child of God. Isn't everybody a child of God? No. We just read in the previous verses that we're waiting for our adoption. If we're waiting for our adoption, who are we before we're adopted? We're children of this world. We're enemies of God, haters of God, who need to be adopted into God's family, who need to be, become, as John 1.12 tells us, the children of God. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right, uh, literally there, the power, the, the dunamai, to become the children of God, even those who believe on his name. I posted something this week. Um, I don't remember what sparked it, but I posted John 1.12. It is a powerful verse, and my question was, is how do you become something if you already are that thing? How do you become a child of God if you are, quote-unquote, already a child of God? There's a metamorphosis. There's a change that occurs that God is active in doing in many people's lives. In John chapter 3, Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter it a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless born, one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. What's interesting here in the verse 3, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Literally, uk dunamai, he is without power in and of himself to do so. It must be a move of the Spirit of God to take our friends, our family, co-workers, our neighbors, to give them that second birth. In fact, just last week, we one of our Christmas songs, Born to Give Man Their Second Birth. We sing these songs, and yet we pass by these verses so glibly and yet the reality can be right in front of us as i've said before and i'll say it again one of the greatest miracles we will ever see at mount pleasant is when god takes a heart of stone right in front of our very eyes gives someone a heart of flesh and they believe in the lord i don't know if any of you have been able to see that in someone but it is a miracle that happens right in front of your very eyes. And that we just immediately pass over that it's a guarantee or that it's a sure thing. No, it's not a sure thing. But instead, it's a great miracle that happens all too often that we just pass over. For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is, is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he already sees? We put a lot of trust into what we see. We put a whole lot of trust into, is this going to hold my weight? Is it going to hold everything up? Is the, the boards I'm standing on, yes, they're a little creaky, but is it going to hold me? And yet, as we look at Hebrews chapter 11 and elsewhere, faith is often in that which is not seen, that which is promised and yet afar off. We go through Hebrews chapter 11 and we see all of those people that were promised something that they in their lifetimes never saw the fruit. Abraham's promise of his seed, yes, he saw his son, but it was speaking of Christ. That's why later Jesus could say, Abraham saw my day and was glad wait, you're not even 50 years old. How could Abraham, you know Abraham? Ah, that is the question. Hoping versus seeing. Hoping versus seeing. Elsewhere in Scripture, it says that there, 
Jesus is talking to his disciples. Blessed are you because you see and believe, but more blessed are those who do not see and yet believe. We're more blessed because we have not seen the risen Christ, because we believe sight unseen, so to speak. God in the flesh, Emmanuel with us. Because of what the Spirit has done in our lives, and because our hope and our trust is in Him, and that these birth pains, these trials are producing something. But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance we wait eagerly for it. Many times, it's that old adage of the rabbit and the carrot, is that when we see something in front of us, we sometimes will just go, well, I can get it tomorrow. Or I can go after it another day. But if you're eagerly awaiting something that you do not see, that you know is coming, you're more patient and more willing to go after it. We don't have transportation like it used to be. I was listening to a story just uh, this week of some of the survivors from the Titanic and how when they came home and their family members found out that they were alive and had survived, the, the weight was killing them because they didn't know whether they were alive or dead. And to all of a sudden one day have their loved one who they thought was dead but is now alive was a great blessing to them versus those who continued to wait and to wait and to wait only to one day find that it wasn't the case. We eagerly await for our adoption that we eagerly await for the Lord's return. And that's what allows us, with perseverance, to endure these child pains, these birth pains that continue to show up in our lives. That is the only way, through God's help and through God's Spirit, that we get through one more year. Are you eagerly awaiting this year? no matter what God might bring. Mount Pleasant has been through a lot. Each of you have been through a lot. Even in the midst of that, have you seen how God has worked in and through those birth pains to see where you are today? And since hindsight is twenty twenty, then can we not trust in a God who got us through all of these things, can get us through another year? Until he calls me home or until he returns, that we can have the patience and the waiting of Job. Poor Abby coughing over there. But with that, as we prepare our hearts and minds for this coming year, we have communion. And Jim, since there's so few, I'll just have Jim come up. Let me grab my Bible. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul gives us this instruction. Even though I know we could probably quote it by memory by now, it's still good to read it verbatim from the text. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night in which he is betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took of the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. 
For as often as you eat of the bread and drink of the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, who, whoever eats of the bread and drinks of the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself, if he does not judge the body rightly. In a moment, the bread's going to be passed. We're going to have opportunities to reflect upon his body that was broken for us and eagerly awaiting for him to return. Jim, if I could have you pray for the bread. On the night he is betrayed, he took bread, and after he had blessed it, he told them of this new covenant, which included us remembering him in his death, in his burial, and his resurrection. That the great promise that he gave to his disciples, that he would never leave them nor forsake them, that he would be with them even till the end of the age, is true for even us. The night he is betrayed, he broke the bread after he gave thanks and said, this is my body which is broken for you. Let us take and eat together. In the same way, after supper, he took of the cup this is the cup of the new covenant. Not like the covenant with the blood of bulls and goats, but instead his blood, which cleanses, as we sing, white as snow. Lord, now as we partake of the cup of the new covenant, may we be reminded that we are partakers of the new covenant, not because of our heritage, not because we're Americans, not because of who our parents were, but instead because you have made us to become partakers of the new covenant. Be with us now, Lord, as we observe and touch and see and taste that the Lord is good. Amen. Thank you, Jim. As we hold this cup, I'm thankful that the Lord has given us a tangible reminder. That it's, our reminder is not just in me telling a story or giving of a few smart words, but instead truly is to fulfill the prophet, taste and see that the Lord is good. I don't think he realized how directly applicable this would be to take of his body and his blood. 
on the night he is betrayed, he, there was many cups that were passed, and we recognize two this evening. One speaking of the blood put upon the doorposts so that the angel of God's wrath might pass. And the other cup speaking of the great supper of the Lamb that is to come. Jesus took of the cup and said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Drink ye all of it. Lord, we thank you that we've had this opportunity to focus upon you this New Year's Eve. Lord, when many around us are partying and having, quote-unquote, a good time and, and making resolutions and causing a ruckus, Lord, I'm thankful that we are here to focus upon you and making you our priority and understanding who you are and what you are doing in our lives for this coming year. Now, Lord, as we sing, may you hear us. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>